Good morning, church. Welcome to Martin First United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Brian. It's so great to have you here worshiping in the sanctuary. Those of you who are worshiping online, we love that you are here too. You know, I had a revelation this past weekend. I think it's easy to be a dog walker because it's a walk in the park. This Thursday, we have uh, the vineyard starting you might have heard communication, and it was correct that the vineyard was starting last week, but with rain, uh, it was postponed. We'll start that this week, this Thursday, 6 o'clock at Beaumont Vineyards. We hope to see you there for a little discussion and great conversation with, uh, with friends. Please uh, bring people if you are planning on uh, coming to that. Dayshore sign-ups are still out there. And our day shore is coming May 28th to May 31st, towards the end of May. Things are gearing up. Crafts are being prepared. Uh, trainings, if you were going to sign up to be uh, a leader, trainings are happening uh, very soon, May 5th, and then a following one the day before day shore. Uh, it's a lot of excitement. If, if you don't know what I'm talking about, please grab uh, uh, Jennifer Vincent or grab me or Pastor Amanda or someone uh, to talk about day shore for our kids, okay, uh, kindergarten through fifth grade. A great uh, camp that we get to offer to children uh, in Martin, Tennessee and surrounding areas. And then next week we have Senior Sunday. Senior Sunday, graduating class of 2024 uh, will be honored uh, next week in the sanctuary for our service. They'll be part of the leadership of this service and they'll follow up with a little senior brunch and we'll get to hear fun stories. We'll embarrass them with their baby pictures and, and the things that one does uh, when graduates are transitioning into their next phase of life. Those are my announcements I have for you. It is so good to see all of you. And I'm gonna pass it over to Pastor Amanda. Let's take a deep breath and turn our hearts and our minds to the worship of God this morning.
Good morning. This morning our call to worship is going to be open the eyes of my heart. We're going to have Roger's going to play the guitar. He said this may be his first and last time to play it on the guitar for us. But he's going to play it on the guitar for us this morning. Um, so we're going to start out with it, and I want you all to join in with us whenever you feel comfortable. I think most of us might know it, uh, but just join in with us when, you're, when you feel comfortable. <laughs> Chrissy, Roger, thank you for that. Can we pray together? O oh God, in mystery and silence, you are present in our lives, bringing new life out of destruction, hope out of despair, growth out of difficulty. We thank you, God, that you do not leave us alone, but labor to make us whole. Help us to perceive your unseen hand in the unfolding of our lives mm -hmm. and to attend to the gentle guidance of your spirit that we may know the joy you give your people. Amen. Will you please stand as we sing our opening hymn? Hymn number 310, He Lives.
invite you to remain standing. We are going to uh, recite the Apostles' Creed together. Uh, you can find those words on the screen as we together profess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, and in heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Would you again pray with me? Lord, we are open to hear what you will say today. Open our minds, open our hearts, open our ears. We need great help from your scripture. And we receive that as a gift today. In Christ's name, amen. Our scripture comes today beginning a series through the book of Acts, and we start with Acts chapter 1, going from 4 to 14. While they were eating together, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. He said, this is what you heard from me. John baptized with water, but... In only a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And as a result, those who have gathered together ask Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? And Jesus replied, it isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away and as they were staring toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to him and they said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking towards heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from in you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they entered the city, they went to the upstairs room where they were staying. Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, Alphaeus' son, Simon the Zealot, Judas, James' son, all were united in their devotion to prayer, along with some women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
morning. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> it's good to see everybody this morning. It's got a star. I like it. Very neat. That's really neat. Very cool. I'm glad he's with us today. So what have I got here? Y'all ever seen one of these? Yeah. It's a paper airplane. That's right. I had to get on the internet to figure out how to fold a really good one. You know, there's like the classic one, but I wanted to do one that was really good. So I looked up this on the internet and I took a lot of time trying to figure it out. And I don't really know how well it's going to fly. But before we try it, I want to talk to you a little bit about this story that Bryant read us this morning. Uh, as Pastor Bryant said, we are starting a, a series on the book of Acts. Did you know that the book of Acts, it was written by the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke? Have you guys ever seen a really good movie and then they come out with a sequel? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes uh, really good stories are so good that we have to keep it going and, and see what happens next. So the book of Acts is like a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. So it picks up right after Jesus was resurrected, and it tells the story of what happens with God's people in light of the resurrection. Okay? So in that first chapter, Bryant read about how the disciples are there, and they're with Jesus, and they see him, and he's in the flesh, and he tells them that they need to go to Jer or stay in Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. So they're excited. They're like, okay, we just saw Jesus resurrected. That, I mean, that's pretty cool, right, to see Jesus be resurrected? If somebody was dead and then they came back to life, that would be pretty amazing, right? Yeah, so there's the, and there's are like, well, if Jesus can do that, what is this power of the Holy Spirit going to do? And so they ask, okay, Jesus, is it now when you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Maybe you may or may not appreciate this, but see, that's the whole thing they were looking for. The whole time Jesus was with them is they just wanted a king. And Jesus goes and dies and resurrects, and they're still looking for a king. Now, they want the king for good reasons. I wrote some of them on this paper airplane here. I wrote it with my Sharpie. I got my Sharpie out, and I thought about, here's some of the things that the people were probably looking for in a kingdom. They, weren't, they didn't just want a king to say they had a king. They were looking for things like hope and truth. Yeah, and peace. And they were probably looking for freedom to worship God and healing. Yeah, it is. It's on an airplane. They were probably looking for love and for safety. And I wrote them all on this airplane. Like Blair said, they're all here on this airplane. Now, is this airplane ever going to fly if I don't let go of it? No. Nope. I've got all these things I want right here. These are the things I'm looking for from this paper airplane, this truth and reconciliation and hope and freedom and peace and safety and love and salvation. But it's not going anywhere, is it, until I let go of it? It is. It's made out of paper. So if I try to fly it, it's not going to go anywhere if I don't let go of it, is it? No. What do I got to do? I got to let it go. Okay, let's see. I, that's pretty good. <laughs> that, went pretty, that went pretty far. Can you throw it back, Ella? Think you can get it back? Nice. Nice. It goes so much farther when we let it go, right? That's the lesson the disciples are learning. And what we're going to learn as we study the book of Acts is sometimes we want good things. We want good things, but we try to control too much of how we get them. Maybe we can have a competition and see who throws the best. We might have a staff competition and see who can throw the furthest. I'll let you know if we do that. 
But that when you think about the paper airplane, I want you to think about the book of Acts, and I want you to think about how sometimes we have to let go to be able to receive the things we want. Okay? You did right now, didn't you? It's right here. Will y'all pray with me? Yeah, just so you know, it's called the bulldog. That's the style of airplane it is. All right, let's pray together. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for the story of your presence and your power with us. Help us to let go of our way of doing things so we can fly with you. We love you. We trust you. Amen. Okay. Thank you. One of the things that I was looking forward to the most uh, about uh, the life of being an ordained pastor was the ability to officiate at communion. I was so excited because that holy meal is so important. And so at the end of my time at seminary, Justin found an Etsy shop that sold handmade com ceramic communion sets and he bought me a beautiful set as a graduation gift. We found out that it was actually made by one of my classmates. We didn't know it was her Etsy shop, but somebody who had been in my class and had walked that journey of seminary with me all three years, it was her hands that shaped this beautiful chalice and patent. I love this set. It's in one of my favorite colors, and it was made by somebody that is dear to me, and it symbolized the beauty and growth that happened during my time in seminary. And it was a tool that I was going to use for what I understood to be one of the most important things we do together as a Christian family in worship, communion. It was a place setting that would invite people to God's table, and it would be a vessel of God's grace. And so while I was serving at Wesley, we used that set almost every week for our communion and worship service. For those of you who don't know, I used to be the pastor at the UTM Wesley Foundation just across town. And there wasn't a week that we did worship where that Ritual at the table wasn't performed. We used it on the first night that I ever led worship there, and there were only eight to ten students there. We used it the night that a student literally came to know Jesus in the communion service while she took communion. We used it the night that we didn't know was going to be the last night before everything was shut down. For COVID-19, that was a particularly special worship service where 60-plus students enjoyed breakfast for dinner made by Phyllis Pritchett. And one of our students, who's actually here, Jeanette Sturman, uh, she preached her first sermon on that night. And we used that communion set that night. Hasn't really been used all that many times since then because we have a gorgeous set here made by a potter that I'm particularly fond of. So since I've been here, that communion set has sat on my bookshelf, among other things that remind me of God's hand in my life and in my ministry. Every now and then it's used for a smaller service, but it's not a weekly thing anymore. A few months ago, right after the funeral service for Charlene Freeman, the rest of us were in the fellowship hall with the family preparing for the meal. And as Chrissy was cleaning up the chapel area, we'd had the service in there, she heard a crashing sound 
come from the office. Now, this was scary for her for a few reasons because she was pretty sure she was alone, so that was creepy. <laughs> but she bravely went into my office to investigate, and somehow or another, the communion chalice had been knocked off the shelf. It sat on the floor in pieces. She carefully collected all the broken shards into a plastic bin and texted me to let me know what had happened. Some of you might remember that week in the life of our church, the week that we held uh, Charlene's funeral, we had five deaths related to our church family. Five people connected to our church died that week. And there were other concerns and difficulties going on within the life of this church family. And I had been kind of double booked on multiple days that, that week. And that day was no exception. Right after that funeral meal, I was scheduled to be with another group of folks that were headed to Jackson for a ministry commitment. And so in my tiredness, in my weariness, in my tenderness, the brokenness of my precious chalice made me so sad. I left the chalice in the bin in my office, and it sat there, broken. It wasn't too long after that that Jennifer saw the bin of broken pieces, and she said, you know, I know somebody that could fix that. <laughs> and I smiled, and I was grateful for the suggestion because I knew Teddy could do it too, and I'd hoped she might be willing. I just hadn't gotten around to asking her. So I gave the box to Jennifer, and in the busyness of many other things going on in the life of this church, I let the chalice fall to the back of my mind. Well, this past Wednesday, I walked out of my office after a meeting with Angie Dameron's family, planning a funeral for yet another saint in our church. And there on Judy's desk, I noticed it. The chalice, standing again, resurrected for the first time in several weeks. Except this time, I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but it's even more beautiful. The places where the chalice was broken and cracked, Teddy used, Ethan, I need your help. How do you say it? Kint Kintsugi? Kintsugi, I think it's, that's how it's spelt, but I'm probably not pronouncing it correctly. It's a Japanese art where they use gold to mend the places of cracked pottery, and they make it even more beautiful than it was before it was broken. It had been resurrected. It was whole again. It's not lost on me in this Easter season that this chalice that held connection to both a lot of life and death stood there, resurrected, beautiful. Its scars were still showing, but it was the scars that made it even more beautiful than before. So this week, we're beginning a new adventure over the next few weeks as we study together the book of Acts. Many of you in your Sunday school classes or small groups will be reading through Acts intentionally as we study this series called Acts Continues, the boundless work of the Holy Spirit. And we consider the ways that the Holy Spirit is still at work in the people of God. As I mentioned with the children, Acts begins where the gospel left off. The disciples are gathered at a meal with the resurrected Jesus. And while they were still eating together, he told them to stay put and that they would be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Still confused, they asked the question, is this when you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? They're still looking for some sort of glorified version of the past. Even with the resurrected Jesus in front of them, they still feel like those shards of pottery broken 
and waiting to be mended. They have no idea what God is up to. In their minds and in their hearts, they're still thinking, is this when you will make everything like it used to be? Is this when you're going to whip those who are against us into shape and make them bow down and get in line with us? And we can't judge them. We do the same thing. It is human nature to look backward instead of forward, to want something that's not quite as beautiful as what we could be in our brokenness. It's probably occurred to some of you, maybe not everybody, but some of you are probably aware that We are heading into a general conference this week in the United Methodist Church. This is the first regular general conference we've had in eight years. In the first one, the church body global has been gathered like this since 2019. And if you remember much about 2019, it was a very painful time for anyone and everyone, regardless of how you thought about the conversation at hand. So this week... As delegates make their way to Asheville, many might be asking, is this when you're going to make everything like it used to be? Is this when you're going to restore the United Methodist Church? Jesus told the disciples in response to their question, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let's pray. Let's pray for our delegates, friend. Let's pray for our church. Let's pray for this important moment and gathering, yes. But let us not put our hope in whatever legislative decisions are made, but rather... May the body that gathers from all over the globe receive in their gathering the power of the Holy Spirit. I mentioned the chalice's connection to Wesley. So that's thinking about General Conference. This is a big global level, but to zoom back in, it means a lot to me that that chalice is connected to Wesley because myself and And I know many of you here are grieving some of the structural and systematic frustrations that have kept the Wesley Foundation ministry from flourishing to its fullest potential in the last few years. Tonight, in fact, at our church council meeting, some of our leaders will be discussing the ways that we are being intentional to partner with Wesley in ministry, not only to help Wesley move forward, but also to see and be curious about the ways that the Wesley Foundation can be in ministry to and with our church. And we don't have all the the I's dotted and all, and all the T's crossed. There's a lot of questions that we have still. And in the anxiety and the stress and the uncertainty of that, it can be tempting for us to look back at various seasons when that ministry was viable. viable. And in its 77-year history, there are plenty of times when that Wesley Foundation has flourished. Many of us remember different seasons when it looked beautiful there. And we might be asking Is this when God is going to make everything like it used to be? Whatever the version of it used to be is that we're remembering. I know I'm asking, God, is this when you're going to restore the Wesley Foundation? After Jesus said these things to his disciples at that meal, as they were watching, he was lifted up in a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away and as they were staring toward heaven, suddenly two men in robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come the same way that you saw him go. Remember, They were sitting together at a meal while they were eating. And here, these ambassadors from heaven speak to the disciples and say, Quit looking up to heaven. 
quit it with your pie in the sky visions of what you think is going to happen. The return that you're looking for, the power of the Holy Spirit, it's going to come in the same way that you saw Jesus go at a meal, around a table, in communion with fellow believers. Friends, the mission is not so complicated. The work of the Holy Spirit, the work of the book of Acts, the work of the church, our work is to gather folks around the table in Martin, in Weekly County, in the state of Tennessee, to the ends of the earth. It is not that complicated, but it is not that easy either. To gather around the table with people who look and think and act and vote and believe differently than me, it requires sacrifice. It requires patience and waiting for the action of the Holy Spirit and God's grace. And it always involves some kind of death, some kind of brokenness. This work of faith that we do together, it has broken me many times. My ego has died many deaths. And as long as I'm living, I am certain that there are more deaths to come. The reason this chalice means so much is because it represents so much of the means of grace through which the Spirit has moved in my life in many of those deaths. The deaths I had to die to start a new uh, career. When I went to seminary, the deaths I had to die to be humbled (laughs) in ministry and and be aware of all of my shortcomings, the, the deaths that I've had to die to be a part of this table that Christ sets. And now, in the chalice's brokenness, it has become another means of God's grace. I texted Teddy and Jennifer, thank you the day that I saw the chalice and I told them it has even more meaning now because it makes me think about the way that friends hold us together and make our lives more beautiful even and especially in pain and in brokenness. This book of Acts that we're studying together, it's the story of the restoration of God's people But let's not get confused. The restoration is no return to how things were. In fact, the restoration in many ways is the death of how some things were. But in that death is the restoration of the image of God in us. It's the gold and the scars. And as our story continues, we continue to live out what God was doing in the book of Acts as we still continue to wait for a new and fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so may we offer our brokenness in service of restoration to the body of Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have much to be in prayer for this week as a church family, as we hold the brokenness of many in this congregation and in our community. We want to continue to pray for Dawn and for Martha and for all of Angie Dameron's family as they had a beautiful service in her honor this past Friday and laid her to rest. Marion Pitts asks for prayers as she battles a kidney stone as well as a pretty bad head cold. It's just pain on a lot of fronts, and she asks for the prayers of her church family. 
We pray for Michaela Majors, who gave birth to a stillborn daughter, Malia, this past week. So for um, Michaela, for Marcus, for Dave and Carol Polite as they grieve the loss of this very young life. We pray for Sabrina Snyder, who had a massive stroke this past weekend and is unresponsive at St. Thomas Hospital in Nashville. We pray for healing. We pray for Katie, her daughter, Blake, her son, and for Mike, her husband, as they seek to advocate for her and just are present with her in these, t in these thin spaces. We pray for the family of Ron Powers, who is a good friend of uh, Dee and Jim Cannon, and also um, the grandfather of Chloe Powers, who attends church with Shauna and her dad, Colton. We pray for the family of Sandy Clayton, who also died uh, this week uh, due to cancer. And we pray for all of those who suffer the effects of that terrible disease. Pray for Amanda Jackson, who continues to have some complications after her surgery. We pray for her relief and her healing. Throughout the time that we study um, this book of Acts, we're going to be looking together at some different spiritual practices. And one of those practices that can help ground us as we're in that space of waiting for the Holy Spirit and looking for what restoration is, it's the simple act of silence. And so as we prepare to pray this morning, I want to ask us to hold all these requests that we've lifted and anything that you bring uh, to the place that's on your heart. All of us come with heavy burdens, with questions, with confusion. Let's hold all of those in the presence of God this morning together with a few moments of silence. God of all creation, who called every being into life, who is mindful of humankind and all its diversity, who embodies us with dignity, granting different gifts and talents to shape life in this world, we ask for your spirit to unite us. Where we face lack of understanding and disunity in our churches, in our communities, and in our countries. And in silence, we lay before you the burdens of our heart. We ask for your spirit to unite us in the face of the conflicts, hatred, and violation of life experienced in so many regions of the earth. And in silence, we bring to you the pain of these victims. We ask for your spirit to unite us wherever fear prevents us from caring for our neighbor, where it prevents us from meeting people of different ethnicities, cultures, and faith communities with respect. And in silence, we bring to you the brokenness of human relationships. God of all creation, in Christ we are reconciled. And so we ask for your united, uniting spirit to help us to overcome all of our divisions so that we may live in peace. Amen. Will those helping with the offering please come forward? Okay.
Will you pray with me, please? Gracious provider, we gather with hearts filled with gratitude for the love and light you've shown us. Your word reminds us that true love is seen in the self-sacrifice of Christ. As we offer our tithes and offerings, we are reminded of the importance of generosity and stewardship in every aspect of our lives. May these gifts be a reflection of the love we have experienced in Christ and our commitment to steward them faithfully for the work of your kingdom. Use these offerings to bring justice, mercy, and hope to a world in need. For it is in your holy name we pray. Amen. Stand for the doxology, please. I invite you to remain standing as we come together to the table. You know, it occurred to me as, uh, as we were singing that nobody was in the room when this thing fell down. <laughs> Maybe that was the Holy Spirit. I, <laughs> I don't know. 
But whatever it is that you carry into this place, whatever it is that distracts you, whatever vision you are holding on to that might be blocking you from being able to see what God is doing, I invite you to let that go in your heart this morning. Hear this good news. Christ died while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love for us. So know this, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Glorious God, in Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, you showed your purpose for your people and your love for your world. In Jesus, you fulfilled your promises and opened to us your heart. In his passion and death, we saw the consequences of our rejection and the depth of your yearning. Yet, you raised Jesus from the tomb. In his resurrection, you invite us into the company of your eternal joy. And in his ascension on high, you seal as complete his work among us. And so you, we praise you with all the company of heaven, singing together your unending hymn. Gracious God, your son, at his ascension, promised his disciples that they would be clothed with power from on high. And so, pour out your Holy Spirit, that we may know the presence of your son among us. Pour out your spirit, that the bread broken and the wine outpoured may be for us the body and the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, who at supper with his disciples took bread gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Each time that you do this, do so in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time that you drink from this, do so in remembrance of me. And so together, let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Generous God, your son told his disciples to stay in the city until they were clothed by the Spirit. Give courage to those whom you call to stay in places of danger and confusion when their hearts are full of doubt and delusion. Your son withdrew from the disciples when they did not know what the future would hold. So be close to all who face an uncertain future and deeply know their need of you. Your son's disciples were continually in the temple praising you. So give your church a fresh outpouring of your spirit and make it a blessing to all the children of your earth until the completion of your son's ministry becomes the completion of your whole creation as we all feast together at the heavenly banquet. 
You are all in all, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. I invite those who are helping to serve to come forward. Friends, this is God's table, and all are invited to receive the grace God gives here. There are stations uh, at four corners. You can go to the whatever one is the most convenient for you, but whichever station that you receive at, know that the altar is open for prayer. You are invited and encouraged to, to uh, come there, however you feel led. Uh, when you go to the station, the server will break off a piece of bread. You're invited to take that bread and then dip it into the cup as you feel comfortable. If you are not able to come to the station, if you'll raise your hand, Alicia can serve you in the pew. And she also has the gluten-free elements if that's a need that you have this morning. Come, all are welcome. Let's feast on God's grace. is a true 
Please stand as we sing our final hymn, hymn number 378, Amazing Grace. This week with our eyes and our hearts wide open to the awareness that even in our brokenness, God is restoring something more beautiful than we can ever imagine. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.